Okay, great. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I haven't had the chance to meet uh, any of you yet because I arrived at the course just this morning. Uh, so I wanted to just quickly introduce myself before going into this module. Uh, so I'm Jared Simpson. Uh, I work at OICR like Michelle and Heather, uh, and I run a research lab uh, dedicated to developing the type of algorithms that you've been hearing about uh, already on this course. So my lab really focuses on de novo genome assembly, which is the procedure where we take uh, sequencing reads and then try to reconstruct the genome uh, from scratch without having to use a reference genome uh, or any sort of assisting information. So before we start, let's pull, let's pull the class a little bit. So who's done an assembly before? Any, any data, bacterial genomes. Heather has done an assembly. Excellent, thank you, Heather. Uh, Heather, who you have met, is my PhD student. Uh, so we both work on these type of algorithms of just taking uh, sequencing data and then asking the question, you know, what can we do with this sequencing data? Can we uh, reassemble genomes? Can we call variation and try to develop those software uh, that hopefully uh, bioinformatics users like yourselves uh, will find useful? Uh, so let's, let's start off with just really high level overview of what genome assembly is. So we start off with a genome, picked it up here. This is, it's very rare for me to not be able to reach up and point to the top <laughs> of the screen. Uh, this is a new experience for me. So our genome in this case has multiple different segments and these red segments might represent repetitive sequence, sequences present in multiple copies uh, throughout the genome, which as we're going to talk about, give problems, oh, thank you, to the point now. Uh, gives problems to, uh, to our assembly. Now, in Sarah's talk yesterday, uh, she told you about the sequencing process. So the most common type of sequencing we do now is called whole genome shotgun sequencing. That means we take a genome, we take many copies of a genome, we fragment it, fragment it into millions or even billions of pieces. We uh, use a DNA sequencing instrument to read the sequence of each individual piece and then we have a large collection of sequence reads. The process of genome assembly is taking this big unordered collection of sequencing reads and just essentially trying to reverse that process. We want to take our reads and then figure out what the sequence of our genome was uh, just from the sequence reads alone. So what Matthew just told you about is if you have a reference genome, if you can align the to a reference genome, you can use that to do things like call variation. We're sort of in this world where either we don't have a reference genome or we don't want to use the reference genome uh, at all. We want to figure out what the reads themselves uh, can tell us. So the first part of this talk is going to be really describing uh, some of the theory behind genome assembly, how genome assemblers work. Uh, and then talking about assembly algorithms for both short read sequencing data, like Illumina sequencing data, and then upcoming sequencing platforms like the Oxford Nanopore and the PAC Bio instruments. The reason that we break it up is that you need very, very different types of technology to assemble short reads than you do for long reads. The sequencing uh, lengths are obviously very different. The error profiles of short and long reads are very different. So we need specialized software uh, to handle handle each type of data. Uh, later on after this lecture and then a coffee break, we're gonna do a practical session where we're gonna have a chance to uh, assemble data sets from all three major sequencing te technologies, Illumina sequencing, PAC bio sequencing, uh, and Oxford Network. Uh, at the very end, I'm gonna make an attempt at addressing this question of what makes short read assembly difficult, or just what makes assembly in general difficult. There's some genomes that if you put, an, put them on an Oxford nanopore sequencer or a packed bio sequencer, you might get a complete, very high quality assembly back, like a bacterial genome. We typically think of as being pretty easy to assemble uh, with modern long read sequencers. Conversely, there are really, really difficult genomes, like say the axolotl genome, which is 30 gigabases in length, which are extremely difficult to assemble. So what I want to address in the last part uh, of this lecture is what makes a genome difficult to assemble and hopefully when you go off and try to do an assembly on your own if you understand some of these things that might make it more complex uh, it will help you uh, have a little bit of easier time. Unless you're sequencing the axolotl, don't do that. It's going to be really really hard uh, and it's going to cost probably a million dollars to sequence. All right so whole genome shotgun sequencing. I already described this in a little bit. The input <coughs> into an assembly process is taking uh, some input sequence, which is our genome, take many copies of it, but is harvesting uh, many cells from 
culture, fragment the genome, copies into many, many pieces, and then read the individual uh, pieces using your DNA sequencing instrument. Uh, an analogy I like for gene genome assembly is if I took all these binders containing the course material, put them all through a paper shredder, dumped a huge pile of shredded pieces, and then said, okay, go back and reconstruct what the sequence of the lecture notes are. So you take each piece, you try to compare pieces that look very similar to each other, and then hopefully build up uh, a picture of what our lecture notes were. Don't worry, I'm not going to do that. Uh, we're just going to use the computer to do the assembly instead. All right, so when we sequence a genome, uh, we worry quite a lot about getting enough sequencing data uh, for our genome. So we might have talked about the term coverage already. Coverage of a genome is how much you've sequenced. The reason coverage is important for uh, genome assembly is that we need to make sure that your genome has been completely sequenced from end to end. And as you sequence more and more reads, the reads become closer spaced together, so you're gonna have more information about how they overlap, and hopefully that will aid you in your reconstruction of your genome. Um, so we have this cartoon picture here. Uh, in blue, we have our sequencing reads. In red is our genome that we're trying to reconstruct. Now, this cartoon simplifies the procedure of genome assembly because we know that this is the first read, then that read is starting from the fourth position, next read is starting from the eighth position, and we can just read off a sequence of our reads one by one to reconstruct our set. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have that information. We don't know which where each read came from on our genome. So we just get this jumbled mess of reads, like this big pile of fragments uh, I said of your lecture notes, and we need to figure out how they relate to each other to try to uh, reconstruct our genome. All right, so we talked a little bit about coverage. We can talk about the average coverage, which is uh, the average number of reads that any particular base in our genome uh, is covered by. We get that by dividing the number of nucleotides in our sequencing collection by the number of nucleotides in our genome. In this case, we have 177 nucleotides divided by 35, which means we have about 7x coverage. We can also talk about uh, the coverage for individual bases. So the coverage for this position here, this C in our genome, is 6 because there are 6 reads that contain uh, that C base. All right, so the basic bit of theory and the basic principle behind genome assembly is that we need to find pairs of reads that have very similar sequences. So if we have two reads where the end of uh, one read, like this, has very similar sequence to the beginning of another read, what that might imply is that they overlap and come from the same position of our original genome. So this is important, so I'm just going to go through it again, because this, the end of this read, which is T-A-T, C-T, C-G, so on, is the same sequence as T-A-T, C-T, C-G, so on. We can infer that they probably came from an overlapping position in our original input genome. So, we could just merge their sequences together to make up a little assembly of that local region of the genome. So is that idea clear to everyone? Just pause for questions that we have so far. All right, so what we're gonna have to do is develop computer programs that will find these sort of relationships between sequences where they share some sort of similarity. Now that's essentially what a genome assembler, uh, software for genome assembly does. So we're going to talk about assembly for those short and long reads today. Uh, so long reads, you've heard about the sequencing instruments. I think you may have seen the tour. Uh, you see some of the sequencers yesterday. So you saw PacBio, saw some Oxford Nanopore sequencers. Um, so th these, these sequencers are characteristic. The main characteristic of them is you can sequence incredibly long fragments of DNA. So luminous sequencers, uh, you might sequence 100 base reads. For a pack bio sequencer or an oxygen nanopore sequencer, they could be 10,000 bases in length or even longer. I think the longest read that anybody's ever sequenced uh, was on the oxygen nanopore sequencer. It's a colleague of mine named Matt Luce. Uh, he sequenced a read that was 2.2 megabases in length. Now, I started working on genome assembly for Illumina reads. I started working on 36 base pair uh, reads for Illumina. It was incredibly difficult to assemble 36 base pair reads. 
Uh, so the idea that we can now sequence 2.2 megaphases, which is like half the E. coli genome in a single read, uh, is really quite stunning. And as you can imagine, having these extremely long reads makes assembly uh, a lot easier. Now, this long read sequencing technology has a drawback, though, in that the error rate of the sequencer is much higher uh, than a luminous sequencing. So for the uh, nanopore and packed biosequencers, the error rate, the rate at which, which the sequencer makes mistakes, is around 5 to 15%. So a lot of the methods that we're going to use for Illumina data don't work for these long error prone reads. And conversely, the uh, methods we're going to use for uh, packed bio nanopore data don't work for Illumina data. So just to, to give care, key characteristics of Illumina data, very high accuracy, it's cheap, so you can sequence your genome to very high coverage. Uh, but the shortened read length is going to limit uh, how well we can resolve these repetitive regions uh, that have been talking about. So the key computational challenge for long reads is overcoming the high error rate. For short reads, is efficiently assembling uh, this incredibly large numbers of reads you get from Lumina and dealing with uh, the challenges of repeats from short reads. So I'm going to talk about uh, two different types of assembler. So we we'll call this the assembly pipeline. We're going to start with long read assemblers. And long read assembler follows a classical method of assembly, which is called overlap layout consensus assembly. So at the start of this pipeline, we have our sequencing reads, which came out of our pack bio or nanopore instrument. We then will put them into a program that computes overlaps. So it's going to look for those pairs of reads that have high similarity. So then going to build what we call an overlap graph. And it's going to traverse through the graph trying to find reads that can be assembled together. We call this the, the layout stage. And then finally, uh, we have a consensus step where we're going to try to overcome this error rate by comparing all the reads against each other and trying to pick what the true base was uh, in the genome that was sequenced. And the output at the end of this pipeline are what we call contigs or contiguous sequences, which are stretches of genome that have been assembled. Question? So again, pack bio reads and aluminum reads, did you assemble them together? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we call that hybrid assembly, which is where you're trying to use the strengths of your pack bio reads and the strengths of your nanopore uh, and your aluminum reads. And some of the common algorithms are yeah, so usually you need specialized algorithms to do hybrid assembly. In the practical, we're not going to do a, a hybrid assembly, but uh, later on I can talk to you about some of the methods or some of the software that we do use for that. Uh, very early on, the way that people perform hybrid assembly is you take your packed bio reads and treat them as if you're, they're a reference genome. You'd align your Illumina reads to the packed bio reads, error correct your packed bio reads, and then put them into you know an assembly that was developed for, say, Sanger sequencing. That part worked pretty well, but it was very, very computationally expensive. Aligning short reads to a very high error rate long reads just takes a lot, to, a lot of time to, to do. Uh, the preferred way of doing hybrid assembly now is to take your long reads, assemble them using one of the very high quality assemblers like Canoe, which we will use, building a genome from that, and then aligning your short reads to your finished genome and correcting base level error. Um, and we call that sort of short read polishing. Um, and again, when we do the practical, I can talk a little bit about that later. On. For that yep. hybrid, do you, do you need like less overall coverage for both methods? Um, or do you use the same? I think you'd still want the same. Like you, to get really long contigs, which is usually a goal of assembly, you need pretty high coverage, 50 to 100x. That's, that's the level of coverage we'll be using the practical. And then to get uh, like the higher accuracy consensus at the end, you'd probably again want about 50x coverage from Illumina. So yeah, it wouldn't really change your, your coverage too much. But right, those are all good questions. Any more before we move on? All right, so we're going to talk about these three steps um, in a little bit more detail. So we're going to talk about how we compute overlaps, how we build and traverse this assembly graph, and how we can calculate a consensus sequence. All right, so an overlap graph um, is a graph where each one of our sequencing reads is a vertex in the graph. So we have a sequence read that starts CTAGG, and then we're going to put a node or a vertex in a graph represented by the circle here. So we have a vertex for every one of our uh, sequencing reads, and then we're going to run an algorithm that looks for pairs of reads where the end of one read matches the beginning of another, maybe with 
a, a single mismatch in the middle, and then we're going to put an edge from uh, the read that uh, the sequence ends with to the read that the sequence starts with. So we call that a suffix prefix overlap, and if we do this for all pairs of our reads, we build up which we call an overlap graph. So this is a really simple overlap graph for just a handful of reads, about 10 reads for this tiny genome here of about 30 bases. So each one of our reads, which are length seven, have, are connected by an edge if the ends of the reads overlap by about three bases. So we can already see you know, some features of the genome. So we have some stretch that goes through here that we might want to assemble together, and then something more complicated uh, might be going on here. Maybe the assembler can resolve this. Uh, maybe not. Yeah, so let me go back a slide. So um, we call the matching part of this read because at the end of the read, the suffix of the read, and we call the matching part of this read the prefix of the read. So the edge goes uh, from the read that with the matching suffix to the read with the matching prefix. So if it's the end of one read, that's where the edge starts, and then it goes to the beginning of now, reality gets a little bit more complicated. DNA is, is uh, double-stranded, and the sequencing read, uh, instrument can read from either strand. So when you build real assemblies, you have to deal with complementarity. Uh, it's really annoying, but for now, we're just going to think about it as if the end of a read uh, matches the start of a read, we draw uh, an arrow between them. All right, so here's our assembly graph. Uh, it's for a small genome, but already it's, it's you know, we can see some features. You can see maybe the path goes through like this, uh, but it's not apparently clear what the sequence of the genome is by just uh, staring at one of these graphs. So that's where the next stage of the assembler comes in, which is called the layout stage, uh, where we're going to try to traverse the graph and figure out which segments we can assemble together. So I'm going to change from using DNA sequences. Whoa, it's not good. It's back. All right, good. All right, so I'm going to switch from using DNA sequences to something slightly more interpretable, which is uh, a fragment from a song. So it's a song from the 60s to everything, turn, turn, turn. Uh, there's a season. Now, the reason that we're going to try to assemble this is this part is going to stand in for genomic reading, one of these segments which is present in multiple copies uh, of our genome. So we've constructed an overlap graph where we've broken up the sentence into random fragments of length seven, and then we found pairs of the, these fragments that have uh, a match at their end, one of these suffix prefix overlaps. Now, if we just build this overlap graph, look at what it looks like. It's really quite complicated. It's not something you just look at and then immediately be able to uh, assemble our genome out of. So what we need to do is a few steps of cleaning up this graph by removing edges from the graph that are redundant. So we're going to call an edge in the graph redundant if it bypasses some node. So in this case, we have this chain of vertices goes from here to here to here, following these blue edges. And then we have another edge that bypasses this central vertex here. In sort of graph algorithms terms, we call this a transitive edge. It's not really important to uh, understand what that means, but what we want to know is that this edge skips over a node. Any edges that skip over nodes, we're going to classify as redundant, and we're going to try to remove them uh, from our graph. So if we remove these transitive edges, if they have this pattern where there's a node bypassed, let's run that algorithm. We get a much cleaner graph by removing transitive edges. If we perform another round of transitive edge reduction, we get another much cleaner graph as well. Now this is what assemblers want to see. They want to see these chains of vertices where it's just one edge coming in and one edge going up. When we think about these as unambiguous stretches of the genome, they can be assembled without any chance of misassembly. You can just assemble all of these reads together by merging their sequences, and you're not going to perform an error uh, at that region of the genome. We call them unambiguous or unique paths. Now, this structure in here is interesting in that the edges start looping back. 
We see a path that goes from here to here, and then back here, and then maybe up here, back here, and it gets really quite hot. Yeah? Why, why does the pruning have to be done iteratively? Like, why doesn't it just get rid of all of those at once? Yeah, that's a really good question. You could do this all in one step. Um, so here we've, we, we've just drawn it for illustration where we prune edges that skip one vertex, and then in the next step, uh, show edges, uh, remove edges that skip two vertices. You could definitely do it in just one step, uh, and, and real genome assemblers would just do it all at once. But we just wanted to show the progression. I think there's another question. Yeah. Just for that first portion there, where the nails are lined up and they don't, do you just, maybe there's no benefit to doing it, just collapse them into one, one node? Yeah, that's what you would do. You would, you would take all of these, uh, all of these, yeah and replace it with one node, which is the assembly of all the string. And that's what we consider the assembly of that sequence. All right, so back to this part. Um, the reason that this graph loops around is that there's multiple possible valid reconstructions on the sequence. Uh, we could have the string, uh, no, what was it here? Yeah, to everything, turn, 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 there's a season. You could also have there's a, uh, for everything, turn, 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 there's a season. You could insert as many copies of that term repeat uh, as you want uh, by just continually iterating through uh, this loop in the graph. So the assembler isn't going to be able to reconstruct how many copies of that repeat it is, is there. So it's just going to uh, contend itself with assembling this part, assembling this part, and giving up on this uh, looping sequence here. So uh, this is what we would get. We would get one contig for this segment, which has a sequence to everything turn, one contig for this segment, which is turn, there's a season, and then an unresolvable repeat uh, in the middle here. All right, so that's the first two stages of overlap layout consensus assembly. The last stage is the consensus step. Uh, so we've now got this assembly of our contig. And we know all of the reads that go into that contig. What we then need to do is calculate a final sequence uh, of that contig. The way that we do that is we create a multiple sequence alignment by lining up each of the reads that are contained within that contig. And then we're going to take at each column of this multiple sequence alignment the base that appears the most times. Uh, we call that the consensus, the majority base, as our output uh, at that position. So in this position here, one read has an A, another read has an A, one read has uh, a gap, another read has an A, another read has an A. So there's four votes for A, one vote for gap. Uh, a is the majority. We have put the A uh, in our output content. There's a sequencing error here, C, but there's four Gs, so a G goes out uh, in that content. Now for long read assemblies, this is actually the hardest part, is calculating this final consensus uh, sequence and something that's uh, one of the current research topics in the field is trying to take uh, a set of long reads and calculate a very very accurate final consensus assembly uh, and that's something that my lab works on uh, for some of our research projects. So yeah. We've been learning a lot in the last couple of days about how to manage this uncertainty. So for yeah. example, you take uncertainty from step one through your pipeline. Many different iterations of how to do that and when to do it. So, consensus to me is you make a decision that certainly is meant is, is managed. Well, here's the product. Is there a reason to ever bring that uncertainty forward into the future? Because it seems to me like the consensus is the elimination of that. But, like, if you go, if for some reason you had to go back to this and say, you know, oh, I remember it was that position that we changed, that's the consensus. Yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing you're going to show us. Why, it, how we would do it if we want to do it to bring that information forward into the pipeline. That yeah, that's exactly what, this is a great point because we try to propagate that uncertainty through. Right. So you heard about, um, in the electron sequencing technology, you probably heard about base quality scores. Right, exactly, yeah. So we calculate consensus quality scores right. to propagate that, to propagate that through. Um, so we want very high consensus accuracy, Q40 or even better, maybe Q50. Um, and 
for good consensus programs, and not all of them will make estimates of the confidence in the final output base. Uh, some of them will, will make friend scores uh, that you can rely on. A slightly trickier issue, though, is that the error mode for long-read sequencing is dominated by assertions and deletions, and it's very hard to put a quality score on an assertion or deletion. You can't say, you know, the sequence is A or maybe two A's. It's very difficult to represent that. So typically, we don't put uh, confidence or quality scores on insertions and deletions. The reason this is important is if you then go try to run a gene finder on the gene that you've assembled, you might come up with a lot of genes that are frame shifted because there was one of these insertion or deletion errors in your uh, your confidence, uh, sorry, in your consensus sequence. Uh, there's just a paper in Nature Biotechnology by Mick Watson, I can circulate that later, that goes into this exact issue of, you know, can you trust your consensus sequences from long read stuff? All right, so at the end of our consensus step, we get a contig. We maybe have some, some quality scores indicating the, the confidence in the consensus. Um, but typically, we consider that the end point of our uh, long read assembly pipeline. So what we're going to now do is talk about uh, short read assembly and how it differs. Now, the pipeline that I just described is uh, how genomes were assembled even back in the days of Sanger sequencing, you know, the 1980s, 1990s. These methods were essentially what were used to assemble the human genome. Uh, it was sequenced here at Cold Spring Harbor uh, in collaboration with many other research institutes uh, around the world. Now, when short read sequencing first became available in around 2007, 2008, uh, people would take their short read data, 27 bases, 36 bases, now up to 100 bases, and try to run it through these uh, assemblers that were built for Sanger sequencing data, and it worked terribly. Basically, it didn't work at all. The assemblers would take huge amounts of compute time, they would take huge amounts of memory, and often they just wouldn't even run. Uh, the reason is that while we can look at these overlaps between really long reads, like a 10,000 base pair, two, a pair of 10,000 base pair reads might have a 5,000 base pair reads, if you have a pair of 100 base pair reads, the overlap between them might only be 50 bases. And for complex genomes like the human genome, there's huge numbers of repeats that are the same 50 base pair sequence multiple times in the genome. So you try to build up these assembly graphs, they'd be huge, they'd be really complicated, you'd have all these looping structures from the repeats, and you just basically wouldn't have any chance to find uh, a path through those graphs that would, uh, would represent your, your genome of interest. So we needed to develop all new ways of assembling short read data. And as a PhD student, uh, a few years ago, uh, I worked on this problem, trying to build assemblers uh, for short read data. So the assembly pipeline for short reads looks like this. We start with uh, a procedure that we call error correction. So rather than leaving error correction for the end of the pipeline, which we did for long reads when we uh, did the consensus at the very end, we're going to do error correction at the very beginning and try to remove any errors in our sequences before starting the assembly. We then build what we call a De Bruyne graph or De Brown graph. We then uh, traverse the graph to remove errors from it. Uh, we'll then assemble our contigs, and then we'll use paired end data at the end to try to build higher order structures uh, that we call scaffolds. Just like the long read assembly pipeline, uh, I'm going to describe uh, each one of these steps. Uh, in turn. So for Illumina sequencing data, the error rate's really quite low, maybe one in a thousand bases, but it has a characteristic error profile where the beginning of the read is usually very, very accurate, and then as you get towards the three prime end of the read, the error rate increases. So I'm going to be referring to this uh, collection of genomes a few times through this part of the talk. Um, these were genomes that were collected as a project which, which is called the Assemblathon. It was a community-driven project where they sequenced a number of genomes, sent the data to people who were building short read assembly software, and then we collectively assembled them to sort of benchmark how well uh, assemblers were performing. Um, and we can see in these different data sets, so for example, this bird, which was a parakeet, uh, the error rate gets quite severe uh, at the end of the reads, whereas for some of them, like uh, this human genome, 
data rate was really even quite modest towards the three prime n degree. But what we want to do is try to clean up or remove uh, as many of these errors uh, as possible. Now, the way that we perform error correction for Illumina data is that we exploit the fact that we have very, very high coverage of the genome that we're trying to assemble. So let's consider this read. So let's say all of the uh, bases in black here uh, are error-free, but the sequencer made one sequencing error in red here, where maybe the mistake is to see there, where maybe there was a different uh, base instead. Now, we can exploit the high coverage by counting the number of times each substring, which we call a K-mer, uh, in the read appears across our entire data set. And the theory here is that substrings that are error-free are probably seen in many, many reads across our entire data set, where substrings that contain sequencing errors uh, are probably only seen once or maybe twice, because sequencing errors are rare and they're randomly uh, distributed uh, across our sequencing reads. So if we count our error-free segments of the genome, we might see them 40 times if our coverage is around 40, if we count the strings that are containing sequencing errors, we might only see them once, and that allows us to just uh, identify where in the reads there might be sequencing errors by counting these short uh, KMER substrates. When we identify a KMER that uh, has low uh, copy number, we can search for possible corrections of that KMER to change it into uh, a KMER that's seen like 40 or 41 times. Now, the nice thing about this procedure is that it's incredibly fast. You can implement this using just hash tables, uh, and you can run error correction on a whole genome, uh, whole human genome sequencing data set uh, in maybe about a day of processing power. Uh, there's a lot of different camera-based error correctors that are available. Uh, one of the first ones was called Quake. SJ was one that I wrote. Uh, and then Supernova, PFC, Blast, Light, or Musk it all use the same principle of uh, error correcting based on KMER counts. An alternative strategy for doing error correction is to find these overlapping pairs of reads, construct a multiple sequence alignment, and then uh, take the consensus base. Uh, but that turns out to be very, very slow for the same reasons uh, the genome assembly using overlap methods uh, are slow. Is there a question? Yeah, so how do you decide the size of the KMER? That's a good question. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, typically, it's a function of your genome size. If you have a large, repetitive genome, you need to use a longer KMER than, say, a short bacterial genome, and also the amount of coverage that you have. Uh, typically, good assemblers, like the spades assembler that we're going to be using later on, will uh, examine your sequencing data and pick the KMER size that will work best for the assembler. Uh, that's a fairly new innovation in genome assembly software. For older software, like a classic assembler was called Velvet, you would have to specify the KMER size, and it was a bit of an art. You might try, you know, many different KMER sizes, see which one gives you the best assembly. Um, but typically for human genomes, we use something around 61, a KMER size of 61. All right, any more questions about error correction before I move on? Yeah? How would you build it? Which gives you the best assembly that wants to Yes, good question. We're going to talk about some uh, how you evaluate assemblies and we're going to look at that in practical. Typically, we would look for three things in an assembly. We want the context to be very long. We want the context to be correct, so they have a low error rate. And we want most of the genome to be assembled. So, you, uh, you know, depending on what your downstream application is, you might care more about long context and highly accurate context. But typically, we want to maximize those three things. Yeah. So how are we dealing with the errors? Are we just like dropping that read, or are we actually changing the base? You'd change the base, yeah. So you'd, you'd try all possible corrections to flip the rare cameras to one that's high frequency. Um, and if you find a unique correction, you would uh, you would apply that and just change the base. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, how big were the cameras for the one you said was like 30 megabases? Oh, 30 gigabases. Yeah, the axolotl genome, they actually did with pack bio sequencing. I, I think actually some groups did try Illumina sequencing. Um, and I, I'm, without knowing exactly, I'm pretty confident in saying it probably failed because it's just so repetitive. Uh, even the pack bio assembly 
um, where they sequenced very, very deeply. Uh, it, it, it's not the best assembly out there. It's, it's a great assembly considering how difficult the genome is, but uh, you know, if you look at modern human genomes assembled with pac data, they're much more contiguous, you know, they're more accurate, they cover more of the genome. It's just a really, really challenging uh, genome to assemble. All right, so, so yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's about 10 times bigger than the human genome. Uh, and it's you know, that extra 27 gigabase looks like it's mostly just low complexity sequence, other types of repeats that make the sound very, very challenging. I used to use plants as my barometer of what what's a difficult assembly, but I've recalibrated to the axolotl <laughs> being being sort of the it's the hardest gen genome anybody's ever tried or even partially successfully assembled. So I shouldn't be too harsh on the axolotl, but it definitely highlights some of the challenges. What's an axolotl? It's like a it's like a salamander. So it's interesting because you can you can cut off its limbs and they'll grow back. So it's it's really A X O L O T L. Yeah, the axolotl. They're they're quite cute if you've ever seen them. Um, uh, so you probably feel quite bad when you cut their limbs off as part of your experiment, but quite important for developmental biology. All right, so uh, let's carry on to the growing graph. Uh, so this is the main data structure that we use to assemble short reads. Uh, so again, this is a Kamer-based data structure where we're going to break up our reads, which are very short, to even shorter pieces. And uh, the reason we do that should hopefully be clear uh, in a moment. So for a different graph, we pick a Kamer size. In this case, we're taking Kamer at four. And then we're taking our sequencing reads, which in this case uh, are like six. And we're going to take every four base pair subsequence in our read and add it as a node in our graph. So we have a sequence here, CCGT. We're going to add it here. The next Kamer in this read is CGTT. It's going to be added here. Next one is GTTA. It's going to be added here. So we're going to slide that four base pair window over every one of uh, our reads and add every unique Kamer as a node in our graph. We're then going to make another pass through and we're going to link up two Kamers with an edge if they are adjacent in some read. So here we have the Kamer CCGT it's here and then the next Kamer is CGTT here. So we're going to link those with an edge. We'll do that for all pairs of Kamers that are adjacent to our read and we end up with a graph that looks like now the reason the growing graphs are so important for short read assembly is that they have this really concise representation of the repetitive reads of the genome. If you remember back to when we were doing that overlap assembly, we've got this tangled mess where we have a repeat. Because we're only adding distinct formers to our graph, no matter how many times the repeat appears in our genome, we're only going to have a single node in our graph representing all copies of that repeat. They might have multiple edges coming in and out, like this uh, repeat here, CGTT. But our graph stays nice and compact, and it's not going to cause the assembly to crash or run out of memory. This graph actually, this is a repeat node, uh, but there is a unique reconstruction where we go down here, back around, and then up here. That would be a path through the graph that traverses every KMR sequence uh, and reconstructs this little toy example uh, uniquely. So this, I want to spend a few more minutes on the growing graph just because it's so important. Uh, this was actually developed for Sanger sequencing. It's developed by a computer scientist known as Pat L. Pesner. Okay. I have 10 minutes, so maybe I shouldn't spend a few more minutes on the growing graph. Uh, this was developed by Pat L. Pesner. He's a computer scientist at uh, UC San Diego. Um, and this was really the key to all modern short read genome assembly. So there's incredibly important innovation uh, by developing this data structure. All right, so let's talk about graph cleaning. So we're now taking a zoomed out look at our De Bruyne graph. Uh, here we have sequence of nodes in gray, and then if there's any residual uncorrected sequencing errors in our data set, they can uh, create little branches off of our graph that look like this, which we call tips. These are just dead-end branches. This branch goes off for two nodes and then doesn't continue. This one goes off for four nodes and it doesn't continue anywhere. So the next step of our assembly algorithm is to look for these branches uh, and clean them from the graph by just removing uh, these tips. We can get another type of 
uh, structure in our graph if we assemble diploid genomes, which are called bubbles. So if you're sequencing and assembling a human genome, humans have two copies of each autosome. Uh, whenever there's a heterozygous SNP or indel between the two copies, we get this structure in the graph where it diverges and then comes back together later on. We call this a bubble. Uh, most genome assemblers will try to uh, remove these to increase uh, the length of these linear segments of our graph. All right, so here's what an assembly, yeah? So what about places in the genome that are the selective, or they're in the polygonic, um, they're the persimic? So like when you, so for example, when you assemble HLA Yeah, this is a good question. You should ask Heather about this. Heather, project. Heather's project uh, is involving in, in developing these sort of methods on analyzing these really complex regions of the genome. Uh, definitely if you try to assemble the HLA, what the luminal reads is not going to assemble very well just because there's so much diversity. But we can come back to that, yeah. Um, I was going to ask, so when we clean these from the graph, are we just choosing one region? Yeah, so let's, let's step through this. Uh, so we're going to do the graph cleaning in two steps. We're first going to get rid of these tips. So what the assembler is going to do is identify all terminal vertices in our graph. So these are vertices that uh, only have a connection on one side. It's then going to walk backwards until place where that diverges from the main part of the graph. And then in the case of a tip, it's just going to remove all of those vertices that are colored in red, because those are probably sequencing errors. So we can just get rid of them. In the case of bubbles, we're going to find our places of divergence, uh, keep walking through the graph and see where they come back together. Now the assembler has to make the choice of which of the two paths through the graph it's going to keep. Uh, most assemblers will just take the path that has higher coverage, so the one that has more reads supporting it. Uh, some assemblers will try to retain this and say, you know, I've put an A in the assembly at this position, but there might have actually been a C. Maybe this is a heterozygous SNP. Uh, one assembler that does a particularly good job of this uh, is called Cortex, which was designed specifically for using this structure to find uh, heterozygosity. But in any case, the assembler is going to choose one of the two paths, collapse it down, uh, and then look like this, and we have a nice clean structure uh, that we can then assemble these unambiguous segments of our graph, uh, merging them together into longer sequences uh, to end up with an assembly that looks uh, a bit like this. <coughs> Sorry. Say again. Yeah, for short reads, uh, typically the length of the segments that we can reconstruct are much, much shorter than full length chromosomes. So the assembler doesn't need to worry about this. You know, maybe we're assembling pieces that are 10,000 bases in length, where the shortest chromosome is what in the dual order, like 50 megabases. So, you know, we don't have to worry about that, uh, unfortunately. It would be a nice problem to have. Um, all right, so the last step of the assembler, I'm going to go through this just quickly because I want to get to the last part of my talk, uh, is scaffolding. So if we have read pairs, we can try to uh, build high order structures where we know the order of each content in the scaffold, but we don't know the exact sequence between them. So the way scaffolding work is, works is that we align our read pairs uh, to our contigs, and then we look for... Uh, pairs where one half of the pair is on one contig and the other half of the pair is on another contig. And if we see these patterns, like all three of these reads go together, we can infer that this read, this contig, is probably followed by this contig uh, in the genome. So we would then put them together into our scaffold uh, and use the known fragment size distribution to, to estimate how far apart uh, they are in the genome. I'm just going to skip that. All right, so quality of assemblies, we touched on this a second ago. Um, so what can you expect from your assembler? So let's say we're going to work on bacterial genomes. Uh, let's say we have a luminary. read. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you do uh, a bacterial genome assembly using short reads, you're probably going to get a few hundred contigs, and they're going to be around 10,000 to 100,000 bases in length. Conversely, if you use long reads, um, you're going to probably get less than five contigs, and for some bacteria, you might get the entire bacterial genome assembled into a circular genome, about four or five megs, depending on uh, the size of the bacterial genome that you're assembling. 
So you can imagine just from these statistics that you're going to get much more contiguous genomes uh, from long reads and short reads. Same principle applies uh, for large genomes. For short read assemblies, we might get, say, 10,000 base pair contigs. For long read assemblies, we might get megabase uh, length contigs or a little bit greater. I think the most recent human and genome uh, assembled with PacBio, the contig lengths are around 20 megabases. So really reconstructing quite long portions <clears throat> of the human genome. Drawback, of course, is long reads are much more expensive. Um, and what you want to use for your own sequencing projects depends a little bit on the type of questions that you're after. Do you need to build a reference quality assembly that you're going to deposit in a database that people are going to uh, depend on for their analysis? Or are you just interested in developing or assembling uh, many genomes and analyzing something uh, about that population? You might want to go with the Lumina instead. All right, in the few minutes before coffee break, uh, I just want to go back to this question about what makes genome assembly difficult. So I want you to participate and help me out here. Uh, I want people to shout out some reasons why they think some of the features of genome or features of data might present challenges to our assembly. We've talked about one already. Repetitive sequence, yes. Uh, exactly. Repeats are the, really the, the big reason why assemblies are difficult. If you have repeats that are longer than your read length, you effectively can't resolve them. So the assembler, no matter how good it is, isn't going to be able to, uh, to reconstruct them. Any other reasons? Whole genome duplications. Whole genome duplications, perfect. You know, if you have, um, you know, tetraploid genomes or, or any sort of, you know, polyploid genomes, Typical in plants, which is why I use an example, can definitely cause problems for the assembler. It's a bit like repeats, uh, but a special type of repeats. Any other? Yeah. Uh, higher rate. Higher error rate, exactly. If, you're, uh, if your reads have a lot of errors, it's going to present a lot more challenges for the assembler to error correct them or overcome that if it's doing overlap based assembly. Did you have one? I was going to say section with low coverage. Yeah, exactly. Uh, very good one. So we aim for typically 50x coverage, maybe 100x for our genome assembly. Um, some regions of genomes are more difficult to sequence. You know, uh, some sequencing platforms are biased towards higher low AT or GC content. Uh, that can bias your sequencing away from certain regions, make those regions difficult to assemble. A good example of that is the plasmodium genome, the malaria parasite. 80% AT content. Very, very difficult to sequence and cover uh, the whole genome, despite it being uh, so important to understand. Did you have one as well? I was just going to say, like, allele differences. Allele differences. Perfect. We touched on that with the HLA. So if there's a lot of variation in the genome. Uh, it definitely is going to cause problems. So I think we covered pretty much all of those. Uh, we got repetitive sequence, high errors, velocity, low coverage, you know, bias sequencing, high error rate. Didn't talk about chimeric reads. If your library prep is joined up uh, different uh, segments of DNA together, that definitely causes problems for the assembler. And then various other types of uh, sequencing problems, like if you have a lot of sequencing adapters in your reads, or you've contaminated your sample somehow. Um, this last one is a little bit special. Sometimes if you're sequencing very small things, like say uh, a mosquito, you can't get enough DNA from just a single individual. So what people will try to do is pool DNA from multiple individuals, but that makes it like you're sequencing something that has very, very high heterozygosity or high variation. Uh, so it makes it more challenging uh, for the assembler. So my group was trying to understand and develop tools um, to sort of uh, display whether a, a given genome based on sequencing reads has these features that might make it difficult to assemble. Uh, so the way this program works, and you're going to get a chance to look at it uh, in the practical, is that we're going to go back to this idea of k-mers, and we're going to count the number of times each k-mer in each read uh, appears. And when we're building this De Bruyne graph, we're going to annotate each node with the number of times that sequence appears uh, across our genome. And we can start to build up an, uh, analysis methods that look at histograms of how many times these k-mers are seen across your genome. And this is for a human genome data set. And uh, this is a distribution of how many times each 51 mer in our human genome uh, occurs. So we have a nice single peak at around 25 copies of 51 mer. We have this large spike at the very uh, left part of this plot where there's a lot of cameras that are seen one, once. Does anybody want to guess why that is? Uh, 
sequencing error. Sequencing errors, exactly. So if a sequencing error, that changes with a good genomic camer to something that's seen very few times, your error correction step is going to try to get rid of that. So this is fairly well behaved. Uh, let's look at this oyster genome. So this is uh, a genome that was published in Nature a few years ago. Um, now when we look at our 51 root distribution, we see that there's two major peaks here. The reason for this is that the oyster has about uh, a SNP every 100 bases. So when you have, you're doing this camer counting, there's a lot of camers that are seen only in one of the two chromosomes, and then another section of camers that are only seen, are seen in both chromosomes. So we have this bimodal peak of our, uh, of our camer count distribution. Now the, the group that tried to assemble this oyster genome essentially tried to sequence it using short reads, failed, and then went on to use a different sequencing method just because of this high heterozygosity. So this is sort of an extreme example, but it can gives you an indication uh, of how that might affect your assembly. Uh, I'm just going to skip this. Uh, we can also estimate the genome size from these distributions. So again, larger genomes being more difficult to assemble, uh, it's important to understand just how large your genome is. Also, you want to know how much coverage you have for your genome. If you want to calculate the coverage, you need to know the size of your genome. So this program will output uh, a prediction of what the genome size is. And happily, we get quite close for the human genome, around three gigabases here. We'll also do some basic quality uh, control, like just looking at your quality score distribution across your read. So again, we see that as we go from the five prime end of the read to the three prime, uh, our average quality scores are dropping. This is indicative of that uh, Illumina error uh, profile where the error gets, uh, is increased at the end of the read. Uh, and this program will also do a simulated assembly to try to help you pick this camer size uh, that might work best for your assembly. So again, this is a function of how difficult the, assembly, the genome is to assemble and your coverage. This program will say, okay, I think of the best content lengths are going to be found at, say, camer size of 41 for this NIST data set. Uh, so you might want to try that for your assembly uh, later on. All right, so to wrap up, uh, we've talked about how assemblers work. We've talked about different methods for short and long read and how uh, each individual sequencing technology has different challenges. So we need to use different methods uh, for them. And then we've talked uh, very briefly about some of the factors of genomes that make uh, assemblies either difficult or easy. If you have any questions about assembly, uh, you can ask me during the practical.